Hello, and welcome to Inside Cancer Careers, a podcast from the National Cancer Institute. I'm your host, Oliver Bogler. I work at the NCI in the Center for Cancer Training. On Inside Cancer Careers, we explore all the different ways that people join the fight against disease and hear their stories. Today, we're talking about tech transfer. Listen through to the end of the show to hear our guests make some interesting recommendations and where we invite you to take your turn. Scientific discovery has inherent value in advancing knowledge and understanding, often represented in scientific papers, sometimes in scientific textbooks, and in rare instances in popular books. But in order for it to have an effect on the broader society, discoveries are launched out of academia into the private sector, where they form the basis of new products that can be offered broadly to meet the needs of the people who can benefit from them. An important early step in this path is technology transfer, itself a body of knowledge and skills. Today we're speaking with experts in this area and are going to hear about programs that were created to help anyone interested in such work learn about it. With me in this first segment are two colleagues from NCI's Technology Transfer Center. Dr. Laura Prestia, Senior Innovation Manager. Hello. And Dr. Lori Whitney, Supervisory Technology Transfer Manager. Hello there. Welcome to you both. So let's start with the fundamentals. What is technology transfer and why is it important in today's cancer research and innovation landscape? Yeah, so I'll take this one. This is Laura. So tech transfer is the, the transfer of knowledge, data, information um, from one organization to another. And it can involve collaborations and managing the agreements between those two collaborators. It can involve patenting and protecting new discoveries, intellectual property, and inventions. And it can involve um, licensing out those patents or technologies by companies who can take them to the next level in commercialization. Um, I think also marketing is in there and uh, making sure everyone is aware of the inventions and discoveries that, that you're creating. And I think in a, in a nutshell, that's, Lori, do you have any additional, yeah, did I miss I, anything? I do, and good luck to everybody with Lori and Laura. That, that should be real <laughs> fun here today. Um, I think, yeah, just in a broad perspective is that academic and government organizations do very basic research. We do preclinical research, some clinical research, but at some point it has to go out to a company to get developed and made into a therapeutic or a diagnostic or that sort of thing. And in order to get there, it has to be transferred in some way and at some stage. And that's what we help with. And all those things that Laura just talked about the agreements and the licenses, those and patenting, those are the sorts of tools that we use to get it out to the outside, to companies for development. So we'll talk a little bit about your education and training programs in a little bit, but um, am I right in understanding that part of your work is to look for uh, technologies that are being developed within the research program at NCI that are suitable for such transfer? Yeah, that is correct. And they come in all different um all different stages. Like I said, they some labs do very, very basic research, which is amazing and cool science, and, but maybe not so applicable or ready yet to be moved to the outside. But then we do all different stages. So we have preclinical stuff going on and clinical research. Um, so yeah, at some point, you know, they interact with us because they, the investigators really want to see it, their, their research turn into something that can be valuable for patients. And so they come to us to help figure out the path to get it there. So what are the strategies that you use to find this kind of research? How do you, how do you learn about it or how do, your, how do the investigators at NCI learn about you so that they make the connection at the right time? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. So basically it comes in in every different way. So sometimes we do a lot of outreach in our office. So we'll go to lab meetings that the investigators have on a regular basis and we interact. Basically FaceTime is really a great thing, whether it's over Zoom in the in the modern world or just going to the lab and interacting with them a lot. So you're there and it sparks their, um, they, they think about it. They think, oh, she does technology transfer and it sparks something them in there and they like, oh, we have a question and then it starts a conversation. Um, they also ha may have collaborators on the outside side companies that they meet at um, 
at meetings that come to them and say, oh, you know, we're really interested in this. Can you tell us more about your technology and how might we interact more with you regarding it? So then they come to us because they don't know how to do that. Um, or they may come and say, you know, we think we have an invention. Can you look at this new manuscript we're about to have published and tell us, do you think there's an invention here? And if so, how do we go about, you know, getting a patent application filed on that? And where do we go from here? So it's really comes at us in a myriad of different ways and through a lot of different um, avenues. And I think one of the biggest things, which Laura can attest to because she works in communications, is just keeping lines of communication really open and having good relationships with your investigators. Yeah, we also try to write up some success stories and about transfer of different technologies and how we've worked with the research labs to make that happen. So we'll publish some different stories in the NIH Catalyst, which is one of our internal newsletters, and um, a bunch of different places. Our website has success stories that you can read about, different ways partnerships has tra have transferred technologies. Um, and we'll also do a lot of advertising for our training programs. And I think maybe some labs that may not do a lot with tech transfer, they hear about it from their trainees who are interested in learning more. And so that information trickles up. So Laura, you said something I think important a moment ago, which is uh, someone contacts you when they are just about to have a manuscript published. So uh, I think commonly people think that if someone publishes something or even gives a presentation at a conference or at a, you know, at a seminar, uh, that precludes um, effective tech transfer. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And you know, sometimes that's the first way they that investigators figure out about patenting is because they publish something or they present something or they have a conversation and then they tell us about this pub publication that they had and then it's unfortunate, right? Because it's out in the public and, and uh, it's publicly disclosed and then you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot for getting um, and issued patent on it. Um, so they, they sometimes they stumble across it and then they learn and then the next time it rolls around, they, it's in their head and they think, oh, you know, I got burned before. So now I really need to pay attention to that. And then it gets their attention and they then are more likely to come to you. So they kind of sometimes they stumble upon it. So, you know, whatever avenue they can get to us is great. So I guess in, <laughs> in, in, in just for our listeners, then I guess if in doubt, reach out to you um, and ask you to take a look at something um, yes, the, at absolutely. the earliest point. Absolutely, yeah. I think, again, it goes back to communication and as much um, communication as you can have with the lab and keeping track of what they're doing and having conversations with them about their research and as it progresses. And, you know, they're always super excited to talk about it, which is what the fun part is for me. Um, so they love to have those conversations. And if you can engage them in those conversations, then you can sort of sort through where their research is at and and um, sort of pathways they can go from there, and one of those might be patenting. So keeping open the communication is just really important. All right, so someone brings something to you, shows it to you. Um, how are you assessing uh, the market potential, the suitability for patenting? Yeah. What are the thoughts and criteria that you look at? And that's a really great question, too, because I think even within our office sometimes in tech transfer professionals, you know, they there's always sort of standard ways you sort of things you think about when you look at a, maybe a new employee invention report that you get when you're considering a new technology. And there are certainly those things that you want to think about, the standard sorts of things. Um, but as a colleague of mine um, always says, every technology is its own beautiful snowflake. And so I think you really have to very much look at what comes to you, look at what stage of development it is at. Is it only in vitro? Is it in vivo? Is it clinical? Where is it at? Um, what unmet need is it um, filling, which is really the most important thing, I think, when we ask an inventor to fill out an employee invention report is, you know, report to me where what the stage of technology currently is, and then tell me where yours is, and tell me what niche or unmet need it fills. So we definitely have that conversation. We talk about whether it's been disclosed or not, like we mentioned, um, which might preclude the ability um, to get an issued patent on it. We talk, we think about what resources um, we have internally at the NIH where we could help the inventors um, get directed to the right other sorts of collaborations or resources they might need to develop it. Um, so the feasibility of its development, um, you know, the market, is there a market for it, which kind of goes back to that, is there an unmet need, um, competing technologies, that sort of thing to, you know, figure out where to go with it. That's the conversation at the beginning. Then you apply for a patent. The patent is not like a manuscript, right? I wonder if people are like concerned. Oh my, you know, it's like writing a whole nother paper. 
um, you know, with all the sort of elements that a, that a scientific research paper has. But my understanding is that a patent is something slightly different. It's, it's uh, really some demonstration, some data, and then uh, a, a discussion of how it might be applied to real world problems. Is that Right. So yes, it is different in that sense because you're really trying to capture the scope of what it, of the technology that you're trying to describe in the patent application. So it's really focused around, um, you know, what the invention is and being very broad and giving a broad description of it. So it's written differently than you know a manuscript would be be written. Um, so there's the big broad description of it, and then you're going to have some claims, obviously, some very broad, some more narrow as you go, um, that are directed. To, um, to the technology, but we always give a, a sort of a rule of thumb to our investigators is once you get to the point of where you have like a first draft of a manuscript, it doesn't have to be a finished draft, just your first draft of your manuscript where it definitely lays out what the idea is, the background and you know what the, te what the technology is and where you're going with it and have some figures and some legends and that sort of thing so that we can have a really good sense of what the invention and what the investigator thinks the invention might be. Then we work from that and then pull from that and then those things go into the patent application. So it's not like, you know, you have to redo a whole bunch of writing in the sense of redo a whole bunch of experiments. You, you pull from the manuscript usually when they're at that stage. And patents are not peer reviewed in the same way that manuscripts are. Right. No, they go to the, uh, in our case, for the U.S., to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and are reviewed by a patent examiner there. And it's, it's a very different sort of procedure. And then it can take a while before a patent might be awarded, right? Yes, quite some time. And of course, there are several stages, you know, and it's always, for new inventors, it's always an education because it is, you know, a lengthy process between the time when you file a patent application and uh, the time when you get an issued patent. Um, so, yeah, it can take quite a bit of time to get there. And just like with publication, there are costs as well. Yes, very expensive. So, yeah, so you start out, again, it's sort of an education for new inventors. You start out, typically, we'll file a provisional patent application, um, and then in a year, if things look good, we'll go on and file a PCT application, and Can then... Can that acronym, sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, a patent cooperation treaty, a PCT, it's an international application. Okay. Um, so, and then a uh, year and a half later, if we're still looking good and this technology is still moving forward and, and we want to proceed, then you file a national stage patent application and that would be, and you pick the different countries you want to file in. And each of those stages can be very expensive. Um, so it's not a cheap endeavor. endeavor. And um, so, you know, the NCI probably, and I can say unequivocally, doesn't file patent applications at the rate that like a company does. Um, so we really tend to file when we know that the technology is going to need some help from industry um, to get it where it needs to be. So filing patent applications really act as an incentive for development of the technology by companies. Right, because if it isn't patented, then it's really not attractive to a company to develop because they can't protect their, right. their uh, the IP. Exactly. So uh, tech transfer offices exist at most universities and research institutes, right? Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. So I wonder what the trends are. Um, I wonder, you know, looking back or maybe over the last 10 or 20 years and looking forward that for that length of time, are you seeing any um, shifts in what kinds of uh, inventions you're getting, uh, the nature of what's being uh, protected and commercialized? I think here at NCI, we've seen a shift in that, you know, um, immunotherapy has become certainly a very hot topic in the last 10, 15 years. So a lot of, you know, we're at the NCI, we're a cancer institute, but we certainly see a lot of um, immunologically associated filings going on. So a lot of immuno-oncology. So yeah, that's a hot space. Um, but we do research in all sorts of areas, so we look at everything. All right, thanks. Um, Laura, um, maybe turn to you. Uh, you've created a series of um, fellowship opportunities at the NCI in the Tech Transfer Center, and I wanted to um, talk a little bit about those. Can you tell us what kind of fellowships exist? Sure. So I haven't created the Tech okay. Transfer Fellowships themselves. They were here long before <laughs> I okay. came around. I think they're maybe at least 30 years old. Yeah. So they've been We have a very, very old and active fellowship program okay. in our mm -hmm. office. We're, we're, I think one of the things we're most proud of, we love our fellowship program. Yes, really for do. sure. And actually, our previous director was a fellow. Mm -hmm. I was a fellow. Lori, you were a fellow. I think a lot of our directors have been a fellow. And a lot of people in our office are fellow, or have been fellows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have maybe 10 or so 
so fellows in our in our office of about 70 or so people total and the the fellowship program is a fully paid fellowship so the the stipend covers the the fellow's salary as well as they have health insurance it's a typical job so at this point if they were to join the fellowship with their interest in tech transfer and following that as a career they would be fully full-time working in tech transfer, learning how to draft these different agreements and learning how to protect technologies and, and the whole thing. So uh, what's the background of people who come to this uh, fellowship? They can have an advanced degree in the sciences, business, law. Um, typically, people will have a PhD and in science. So you'd think, oh, tech transfer, maybe it's a lot of lawyers or business people, but it's really heavy on those with a science background. And then we kind of teach what's needed from the business and law sides. And I guess, <clears throat> I guess that's because ultimately they'll be looking at the science that is being discussed in, in, in the context of transfer. Right. So having that ability to dive into certain experiments and understand what pieces of those inventions will become the claims in the patent and understanding what's necessary for invention development and drawing those connections with uh, maybe the standard of care in the field and trying to see like where this science that we have here sets, is set apart from what's already out there. Strikes me as sort of similar to the kind of program and review work that a lot of people at uh, NCI do as well. You get to stay in touch with the science, you get to read a lot of cool science, think about science, but you're not yourself primarily doing research. Exactly, it's a really nice way to stay with the science even though you're not in the lab. So uh, I understand that the uh, Tech Transfer Fellowship has uh, three different tracks, is that the right way to describe it? Yes, yes. Yeah. So typically, the, the more traditional track is the negotiator track. And we also have a business development and marketing fellowship. And then within the past couple of years, we have an innovation fellowship. So the negotiation is one where the fellow focuses on the typical duties of a tech transfer manager. So everything that Lori was talking about from meeting with the labs, learning about what work they're doing, helping identify whether a new discovery could be an invention and whether or not we should patent those and make those recommendations. And um, they do a lot of interacting with the, the patent um, law firms, the PTO, and um, drafting agreements with collaborators. If there's um, a lab that wants to work on a project with a company, they'll interact with that company and help draft the terms of the agreement and working on the, the different licensing. If we have a patent and there's a company that wants to come in and take that patent as a license and um, commercialize it, then they'll draft the terms of that license as well. So they do the typical tech transfer duties. Yeah, what about the um, business development and marketing group? We have a special unit in our office called Technolo Technology Analysis and Marketing Unit. And in that group, they analyze the market space for the technologies that we have patents on. So they identify potential partners that might be interested in working with us. And um, they essentially help spread the word about tech transfer it, to companies who may not know they can work with the NCI and let them know here's who you would contact if you're interested in a technology. If you want to look at what technologies we have, here's where you would find them. And, and they really go out and do a lot of that outreach at, at conferences and meetings. That kind of makes the point that it's not as if you're um, you're done when, say, the patent is issued or, or applied for. You're then also shepherding uh, that technology into the marketplace. Is that correct? Right. We want to make sure that it gets out there. And actually, the, the inventors themselves do a lot of that marketing just by virtue of going to conferences themselves and, and having you know their own presentations. I think that's one of our top ways that we, we get partners for, for these sure. technologies through the inventors. Yeah. And then there's the third track, the innovation track. That sounds cool. 
Yeah, this one's relatively new. And this kind of stemmed from where my career trajectory has, has taken me. So I have a, a PhD in neuroscience, moved into tech transfer through one of these tech transfer fellowships, specifically the negotiator role. And then I, I dabbled in marketing and invention development for a little while. And all along the way, I had this passion to help spread awareness about tech transfer to scientists. Because as a scientist in grad school, I had no idea what tech transfer was. And, and one of the ways I found out was I had, um, hey, what did I have? I think I presented at a conference my graduate work and one of the one of the tech transfer officers from the university came and spoke to me and he was like hey have you talked about um patenting this and and i was like oh no i did not know that was a thing and um, so i kind of learned by being burned and i didn't i didn't want that to happen to others so um as i was learning about it i moved into the field and so this innovation fellowship is really helping to create more awareness about tech transfer to scientists and helping to create new programs that can help train scientists who want to move into tech transfer, help train scientists who want to stay in the lab, but know about tech transfer and learn more about what's important to develop their technologies. Very cool. And the, um, the eligibility criteria, they're similar for across all these three different um, tracks in your in your fellowship right right yeah so an advanced degree in the sciences law business um and then also just um, our cancer research training award this the CERTA fellowship that we have the eligibility includes receiving their most current degree within the last eight years and u.s citizenship or permanent residency eligible for citizenship within four years. So okay. those are our requirements across the three. But people outside the NCI can also participate, right? Yeah, that's primarily, we do a lot of marketing to graduate schools and also postdocs and anywhere. So yeah, there's a lot of availability. And there's, is there just one, one application cycle a year or how does that work? The admission is rolling, so right. they can apply at any time, but we do post on our website when we have current openings, Got like it. we do now. Well, and we'll be putting links in the show notes so people can find your, your website and, and see what's going on right now. Great. So in addition to these fellowships, you also have uh, training opportunities, right? You have um, the Technology Transfer University. Yeah, so that's uh, an internal to NIH program available to NIH staff. And it talks about all of the different processes of, of tech transfer. So it goes into, it's seminar based over maybe a, a couple of months. And it's taught by NIH tech transfer staff for the for scientists, for tech transfer managers who are just joining NIH and the, and the community. So it's kind of a good starting point if someone is, is sort of curious about this domain. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's no application for Tech Transfer University. Got it. Uh, and then there's an ambassador program as well. Yeah, so the ambassador program, that was the, the passion project that I started with two other fellows when I was a fellow here. Mm -hmm. And we all had that same thought process. Why don't scientists know about tech transfer? So we, we started this program to help spread more awareness about tech transfer and how they could be useful to scientists in the lab and also as an alternative career. And then uh, last but by no means least, um, the new, there's a relatively new program, right? The Transition to Industry uh, program, which you helped develop, right? Yeah, I worked. I worked to implement it. It was not my brainchild, but okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So that is for NCI Center for Cancer Research postdocs or research fellows who are already here working on uh, an invention and working on that in the lab. So they have a, a patent application has either been filed or is pending, or our office has recommended that a patent be filed for the technology they're working on. And they're interested in further developing this technology, taking it to market, and they can, um, they have a, 
goal to work in industry themselves or maybe even start their own company. So we kind of help teach them more about tech transfer. We teach them about um, small business innovation research development grants. I recently heard Michael Weingarten on a previous podcast. Yep. So <laughs> anyone wants to go back and hear more about SBIR, but we have um, it's half tech transfer, half SBIR training for fellows who want to move into industry. Great, and we're going to learn more about that after the break. But um, lastly, then, I'm curious, uh, Laurie and Laura, what led you uh, into science? What led you into this particular line of work? I wonder if you might share with our audience a little bit about your journeys. Yeah, so I already alluded to I kind of learned by being burned. Yes. <laughs> and um, But when I became interested in learning more about tech transfer, um, I asked my PI in the lab, and I was like, what, have you heard about this? And you know, how can I learn more? I'm really interested in it. And he said, well, maybe you should talk to Lori Whitney. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. And it turns out Lori was in, uh, she was a neuroscience graduate student back when at my university. So I reached out, she was at NCI as a supervisor in tech transfer at the time. And I just asked her all of the questions. We had a really nice informational interview and she let me know everything that you know I should do to really learn whether or not I wanted to move into tech transfer. So I started working in the tech transfer office at my university to gain experience and really see if this was what I wanted to do after my PhD. I took a class at the law school next door in tech transactions and intellectual property. And I worked with our um, business incubator that was attached to the school to learn about the business side. And eventually I ended up joining NIH as a tech transfer fellow. And now here you are. And here I am. <laughs> what about you, Laurie? Yeah, so we spring from the same sort of roots, Laura and I do. Um, so yeah, we I was the generation ahead of her in graduate school, and we both got our PhDs in neuroscience from the same place. And I, when I was in graduate school, um, ended up doing a postdoc at NINDS here at NIH. And so I worked as a postdoc for three years and really enjoyed it. But you know, a lot of the great things about working at the NIH, and there are many, um, one of them is that they have things like this that we're doing right here. And one of them back then was that they would have seminars on alternative careers in science. And so my fellow postdoc and I would go and listen to these seminars. And one day I came away and had heard one given on tech, tra on tech transfer. And I kind of turned to the other postdoc I was with and was thinking, what is this tech transfer thing? And she said, oh, I know, because back in my, when I was in grad school, I did a little rotation in our tech transfer office. And so she explained to me what it was. And I said, huh, that sounds kind of interesting. So I went and I got here at NIH. We have this um, wonderful organization called the Foundation for the Advanced Education in Sciences, or FAES, and they offer classes. And so back then, I, there was one technology transfer class offered. Now I don't even know how many there are, probably 12 or something. They're amazing. Wow. Um, so I took that one class, and it was, you know, Wednesdays, I think, from like 6 to 9 p.m. or something. And I took it and thought, you know, after working in the lab all day, I'd be kind of like, oh, and I loved every bit of the class. I stayed fully awake for all of it, enjoyed the content immensely. Um, and through the class, like uh, Laura mentioned, a lot of the tech transfer prof professionals at NIH teach the classes. And so got to know them and ask a lot of questions and got introduced to the fellowship program at NCI in our office and then became a fellow and then stayed because it's awesome and wonderful. And I can't imagine working anywhere else because it's fabulous. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Um, closing then, I wonder what advice you might give uh, to people who are listening, who are perhaps uh, focused primarily on research at this stage in their careers, but are, are thinking about um, other things to do, maybe tech transfer. What's your advice? The advice I would give is just talk to people and try to experience the, the work that you might be doing in whatever field it is, whether it's tech transfer or something else. And um, I think too, if if an opportunity does not exist, try to create it because none of the internships or experiences that I had in grad school toward tech transfer existed before I found them and worked with people to give me a chance to take to take them. Um, so I think you know just because something isn't there doesn't mean that you can't still get the training and and create something out of nothing for yourself. 
Lauren? I would agree. I think the most important thing for anyone, and not just in tech transfer, is if you know you th or you think you're interested in a field, is to do informational interviews. People who work in the field are almost always thrilled to have conversations with people um, to share their knowledge and share their enthusiasm. And it give, really gives you a flavor for the job. And I think especially technology transfer is this huge field. It's not, you know, it's it's just such a broad field. In our office, I would sell our office and a fellowship in our office on the fact that we do soup to nuts tech transfer. We do patenting, we do licensing, we do collaborative agreements, MTAs, CDAs, cooperative agreements. We do marketing, we do just everything you can imagine. So you really get a good sense of um, what goes on in each of those areas, get some experience at it, um, because you might decide that you really enjoy, you know, patenting more and you want to go work at a law firm or something. So you can sort of find the area that you really love, or maybe you decide you love all of them and you want to stay, which happens a lot in our office. So really doing informational interviews, I think is really important. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, we'll take that as an offer to put your contact information absolutely, in the show notes. Absolutely, absolutely. Sure. We love to chat with people. And like I say, most of the people, and not most, but a good, fair number of the people in our office were fellows at some point. Um, so we really enjoy it. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you both for coming on the pod and sharing about this important work. Yeah. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. It was fun. The NCI wants to hear from you about what we are doing to support early career cancer investigators. We've released a new request for information, or RFI. It's entitled, Inviting Comments and Suggestions on the National Cancer Institute's Support of Early Career Mentored Cancer Researchers and Trainees. NCI is committed to supporting the training and development of the next generation of the cancer research workforce, and we're seeking input on our existing approaches and your ideas for innovations we might explore all designed to improve how we support you. We invite suggestions and comments on all the career stages we support from middle school, high school, undergraduate and graduate studies through postdoc and fellowship to early research independence. NCI is interested in your opinion and how our grant awards are structured and positioned and whether they could be improved to meet the needs of a diverse cancer research workforce. Your feedback on this matter would be greatly appreciated. Responses are due by December 29, 2023. We'll put a link in the show notes, but for questions, you can also contact us at nci underscore early career underscore rfi at mail.nih.gov. We look forward to hearing from you. Welcome back. We're now going to turn our attention to the Transition to Industry or T2I Fellowship, an exciting program in the Tech Transfer Center. To talk to us, about this, we are welcoming Dr. Trang Vu and Dr. Sabina Kachanowska to the podcast. Welcome to both of you. Yeah, thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, also still with us is Dr. Laura Prestia from Before the Break. Um, so Dr. Vu is a research and development scientist at Vittoria Biotherapeutics, where she's developing CAR T-cell therapies for cancer. Before that, she was a postdoc at NCI and a T2I fellow. And Dr. Kachanowska is a staff scientist in NCI's pediatric oncology branch. Before that, she was initially a postdoc fellow and then a T2I fellow in the same group. But let's start with Laura. Please give us a description of the goals of the T2I and how it works. Sure. So this program was started in 2020, back when we were really hearing a lot of interest in postdocs wanting to move into industry or get more experience in translational research and development, but still remain in, in the lab and to have that additional training on the side. So we worked across various offices in the National Cancer Institute to create this specialized fellowship for them. And it allows uh, a postdoc in the Center for Cancer Research to continue working in the lab about 80% of their time, focusing on invention development research to really move along the progress of an NCI invention. And they have an interest in either working in industry or moving their invention towards industry where it can be commercialized and then reach to patients. So they spend 80% of their time in the lab working on this um, translational research. And then the other 20% of their time 
is spent learning about entrepreneurship, tech transfer, commercialization, small business, innovation, grantsmanship, and, and all sorts of different things that will help them not only move the technology towards industry, but also help them in their career, whether or not they want to go into industry themselves. Maybe they want to start a company. Maybe they want to work in um, biotech, or even if they want to remain in the federal government or in academia and really do that translational type of work. Uh, so the curriculum really focuses on and translational research and, and development over the two years. And just to uh, make sure we, I'm, I'm clear on this, that it's restricted to um, uh, fellows and graduate students and um, uh, research fellows and postdoctoral scientists and visiting fellows in the Center for Cancer Research at NCI. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So if you're if you find this program interesting, listeners, um, maybe think about joining CCR for a postdoc. Um, exactly. <laughs> great. I'd like to turn to our two alums now, um, and let's start with you, please, Trang. Uh, how did you first hear about T two I, and what what made you think that this might be for you? Yeah. So I I think that it was probably um, October or November of um, twenty. 21, I think. So when I was reading just um, the daily email from the NCI or the CCR, and there there was like this awesome new uh, fellowship that's going on. And basically just like what Laura just gave a short description about. And I thought it is really neat because my background uh, was a an engineer. So I went for undergraduate and graduate in chemical and biomedical engineering. So I always think of how do I make a product and how do I bring something into reality and help people. And um, so at the time I was working on a very interesting project in Dr. Penjang lab and we just about to publish at the time and we, we also file a patent for that novel genes that we found and we think it would be so cool if we can bring that into CAR T cell and make CAR T cell much better for solid tumor and that was the base of the, the start for my proposal for the NCI's fellowship because the whole thing about NCI, the, uh, the, the T2I fellowship that was very appealing to me was that the opportunity to gain more industry knowledge and try to push your project from benchtop to bedside. Sabina, same question for you. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, it's great to be here. I actually am part of the inaugural T2I class. So I heard um, about the program initially through through email announcements. Um, and I went to an information session that was run by Sabarni. And it, it sounded really interesting because um, similar to Tring, I've always had an interest in translational research and taking technology from the bench um, and bringing it to the community and trying to develop new therapies. Uh, so I um, I applied and we had we were in similar position. We had just um, put in an invention update report and we're going through the process of submitting a patent application for our technology. And it was kind of a black box, like neither myself nor my PI really knew what the technology transfer process entailed and how a patent became a patent and how all the intellectual property protections worked. Um, so it was just really interesting for us as we were starting this project and thinking about bringing it to the clinic, um, how we can kind of look to the future and plan for translating it um, beyond just a clinical trial at the NCI, but into a technology that could one day be um, taken up by a company and actually commercialized into a product. So, uh, Sabina, when you were became aware of this opportunity, did you immediately bring it to the attention of your PI? Is that is that part of the process? I did, yes, and and she was very supportive, and she had um, tried to kind of submit invention update reports in the past and hadn't had a lot of success moving forward through the patenting process. And I think for us, and especially for me, I didn't learn about intellectual property 
property at all in graduate school. I didn't know what technology transfer was. So even knowing what is patentable, what's not patentable, what you can do before you submit a patent versus what information you have to kind of keep close to your vest before that application is submitted. Um, all of that information was brand new to us. So I think it was very helpful because my PI is also very passionate about bringing new technologies um, into the pediatric oncology space um, and how to bring that research forward. So Trang, what about you? Uh, did you have conversations with your mentor early on? Yeah, I did. So it's uh, similar to Sabina. When I saw the email and thought it was interesting, I showed it to my PI and he was very supportive because at the time we also trying to explore that new genes that we found and uh, the, the, like the functional of that and having all the potential. So the TGLI program is really great because it's not just helping the fellow, but it's also an opportunity for us to gain more traction in our research and getting our research out there, getting collaborations and feedback from all the experts in the field as well. So we were, both were really on board about this. And so what was it like to apply for the fellowship? Uh, so I remember, so at least for me, it was um, coming up with like a full project proposal and uh, just trying to come up with ideas and uh, think of how I'm going to make this uh, happen. So it's not the first time I wrote a project proposal, but it feels like the first most formal formal and the first time that it's like really more on me and not like helping my PI so I thought it was uh, really neat yeah how about you Sabina I, I, I believe it was the same process um at the beginning but yeah submitting a, a proposal for the um for the research and specifically in a a way that had clear milestones over the two years of the program um, and it was very specific in terms of what you can accomplish in these two years and how those milestones will help you advance the technology. So it was a little bit um, of a different way of thinking about a grant because you're not just your your end result isn't just I want to publish a paper. It's how do we move this technology forward and make it more attractive potentially for company interest to do um, a creator or license the technology and how can we generate data to attract those kind of industry partners? What about uh, your own um, personal goals? Like in a fellowship often, you know, the applicant is also talking about their own career. Was that part of the application? Yes, it was. Thank you for that reminder. <laughs> it's, it's been a couple of years. Uh, but yes, we also had to write a personal statement and I, um, I've always been interested in industry um, honestly, if you asked me 10 years ago, if, if I saw myself being at the NH for so long, I would, I would have been surprised. Um, <laughs> but the NH is a very translational place. Uh, so in that way, it's, it's kind of similar to industry, but I've always wanted to go into industry and technology development to try to, to bring drugs to the public. Um, and in terms of my background, I've always been interested in kind of that area. I, um, I also studied economics as an undergrad, and it, it's just a kind of came full circle of bringing the science um, and the business aspects together and learning more about them together, um, because biotechnology is kind of a unique field in terms of how you integrate the science into your business models. Trang, let's start with you. What was it like being in the T2I Fellowship? Um, well... I guess the first one was surprisingly intense for me for the first month. <laughs> Laura knows because um so I mean because uh, I've been on other fellowship before, but I think when I get into T two I, um, we started off with a boot camp right away. It's uh, with a technology transfer boot camp, so um, I think the whole experience was very immersive and is right on the very beginning it's a get-go start learning start putting yourself out there and besides just tech transfer like and learning about patent law and business 
for me, Tito art really helped pushing me out my comfort zone and pushing my border. Because um, what I like the most Beside all the knowledge um, that we learn, is that the ability, the opportunity to meet fellows from different background, people who are doing uh, just like tech transfer and people who are working at FDA, different institute as well, mm-hmm. um, and talking to people in different paths really helped to expand my horizon and help me learn what I like and what I don't like. And uh, Laura, help me here because I'm blanking right now. But I, I remember last year, um, in last November, uh, September to November, we have a, uh, a program. I forgot the name. Yeah, it's called the Advancing Innovations Through Mentorship or AIM program. Yes. It's our internal yes. i which is in a lot of um, academia, institutions, and or other organizations. Um, so, yeah, that's our internal version. Yeah, but that program, uh, what I remember, one of the things I appreciate the most was that we, as part of the assignment, we have to reach out to um, 2030 expert in the field to talk about what is what is their experience and what they think is still missing or lacking in the field and how may our project or product fill the gap. And that helped me gain so like a new understanding in what I am trying to working toward in the cell therapy field, but also just the the sheer skill of reaching out to people, call email and talking to other people. I I was very surprised to realize that uh, most of the time people are super helpful and super friendly. And yeah, I think it was a really nice experience. Sabina, you were part of the first class. Uh, Was your experience similar? Um, Yes. uh, Ours was a little different in that um, our program started January 2020. So our boot camp started in person and then quickly everything switched to being virtual. Mm, Um, But it was very quickly adapted. I thought the instructors current at that time we were in the technology transfer boot camp part of the program. Um, and the instructors really did adapt to the virtual format very effectively. So I thought it was very informative because all of that information, the patenting process, the types of agreements that NCI does through its tech transfer office, all of that was really new to me. So it was great to see um, what the technology transfer office does and what we're asking of our technology transfer manager on a daily basis, um, specifically in the context of our project and how um, we can best move our technology forward together um, through that process. Uh, but the other really um, key um, benefit, I think, from the program that I personally got was really great networking. Um, and Trang mentioned networking with peers, uh, which was great to meet people that are also have the similar interests on campus. But beyond that, being able to work with the SBIR um, or uh, Small Business Innovation Research Development Center here on campus, um, as well as taking courses through FAES, which are run by local um, experts and leaders in industry, people who work uh, for venture capital. They would bring in speakers from all different um, areas of industry, uh, from the U.S. Patent Office, from different uh, institutions that uh, fund biotech in Maryland. Uh, so it was a really great networking opportunity to interact with these people in a small group setting um, and really learn about all the different aspects that goes into uh, starting a company, but beyond that, just moving a technology forward and all the different components and stakeholders that are involved in that process. Oh yeah, I was just about to mention, uh, say that it's, I'm so glad that you mentioned about SBIR because uh, it's such a, um, very unique opportunity, I, I feel like, because most of the time as PhD and postdoc, we try to write grants and submit a grant, but for once we got to sit on the review board and be on the other side, see how the whole process going and shift our gear of thinking to become a reviewer. 
So yeah, I felt very privileged actually to be able to have that experience because、uh, it just changed your viewpoint a little. Yeah, you learn so much from being on the reviewer side.、Um, yeah. I think when it comes to any kind of application. So Sabina, you, you、um, are still at the pediatric oncology branch. So I'm curious, how did the T2I fellowship equip you、uh, for doing what you are doing now? And what are you exactly? What exactly are you doing right now? Yes, that is correct. So I am still in the same laboratory I was in when I participated in the TTI program.、Um, it's under the、uh, leadership of Dr. Rosie Kaplan. We're the tumor microenvironment and metastasis section,、um, and we are developing、uh, technology using genetically engineered myeloid cells、uh, for the immunotherapy of cancer. And that's the technology that my my TTI program. Revolved around, and that we're trying to move forward into the clinic.、Uh, so, as, as you know, that is a very long process.、Um, we've been working closely with Eric Chang in the Tech Transfer Office to file、um, multiple patents at this point,、uh, from an intellectual property standpoint.、Uh, but then, clinically, we're working on、uh, the development of the manufacturing process with the Center for Cell Engineering. Um, and trying to put together our IND package to to start a first in human trial of these genetically engineered myeloid cells. Just expand that acronym for us, our IND. Oh, sorry, investigational new drug application, and that's、um, a filing that you need in order to per- perform a clinical trial in human patients. It's it's quite a major milestone for any new therapy, yes. right? Yes.、Yep. Yes, it is, and there are a lot of components that go into it. And the technology transfer really has to happen in parallel with that. So while we're moving that the research part forward and the science forward, we also need to move forward、um, with our intellectual property filings,、um, as well as trying to gain、um, kind of industry support. So at the NIH,、um, we can do a phase one clinical trial, but really most things beyond that, once you go, especially the phase. Three and we're going to need industry partnership to really move the technology forward. So we're trying to to look ahead, engage where where we can get those industry partners and try to license the technology.、Um, and and a big success story from the NCI that has done this effectively is from Steve Rosenberg's group in the surgery branch. They were able to take their、um, T cell technologies and、uh, work with Kite Pharma and really bring that. To a product that is now available, these CAR T cells are now available to patients. So that's kind of the big pie in the sky is、um, trying to get our our science to a point where we can we can partner with industry and and bring a a new drug to patients who really need it. That's a fantastic goal. So Sabina, are you then is it fair to say you're the local expert in this tech transfer process on the on the on the lab side? Um, I wouldn't say expert, but but definitely an ambassador. I think learning and working with the Technology Transfer Center has really、um, improved my confidence in talking about their mission and really getting other people excited、um, about what what their office is doing. Because I think it's so important.、Um, and at least in my science training, there was a big gap in terms of、um, knowing about what you have to do to be successful in this process. The fact that You, you have to file before you have any public disclosures, and thinking about what about your science could lead to a patent, and you really have to think about that early on in your project,、um, and then as you develop your project in the lab, thinking about what indications you want to go into becomes really important,、um, and and different milestones like that. I think it really does come back to to the lab and how we design our experiments moving forward. And Sabina, I remember you had like several offers from industry at the end of T two I too, right? So you had your choice if you wanted. That is to, true.、Um, I, <laughs>、um, I was very fortunate to have people approach me after、um, talks at meetings、uh, and after our, our paper was published, especially, and、um, and try to recruit me to industry. And、uh, part of me wanted to go, but on the other hand, I was really invested in the in this project and. I think I have a really unique opportunity to help bring this forward. So industry will be waiting for me, but right now、um, I'm here at the NCI and I'm excited to to try to push this forward. 
Um, and I don't think that would be possible without without the tech transfer office and mm. and all the information from the T2I program that I can now bring back to my PI. And and we we kind of she she is an honorary T2I member. <laughs> she is very involved in the process and um, very supportive of me being in this program. So I think we both gained so much from participating. So Trang, you took uh, your T2I experience uh, into a into the private sector, into a, a small biotech company. I understand, Vittoria. Tell us um, what made you take that path. I feel like it took me a while to actually know what project and exactly what field do I want to be for my career. Until I started the project with Car T Cell, in I think since the day that we start working on it or start talking about it, it just clicked to me that I want to be in this field and this where I want to grow my career in. So I was very excited and engulfed in the project um, that we were working on for the T2I program, which was a gene edited Car T Cell. And uh, it was so happening by chance for me that a couple months ago, around in March or so, I got approached by a company, uh, which is for my current company right now through LinkedIn. And they are looking for a scientist with gene editing, a CAR T cell background. Um, so it's exactly the same, everything exactly the same as I always wanted. And uh, I knew that I always want to go back to Philadelphia as well because my family is here and Philadelphia is developing as a cell cell and gene therapy um, bio hub of the Northeast. So the company that I'm working in is called uh, Victoria Biotherapeutics and when it was founded, uh, co-founded by um, Dr. Marco Riala and Dr. Karjun in um, the UPenn. So everyone know of Dr. Karjun and Dr. Rosenberg. And I got to say, I was a little starstruck when I looked up the company and I saw Dr. Riala and Karjun as a um, scientific advisor on the company. And I was really interested in the product itself. So when I started the company, we uh, this is a very uh, small company. We are a startup with less than 10 people. And when I joined uh, in the spring, we are in the process of filing an IND as well. And in fact, that what I was working on in the past six, seven months, and as of this Monday, the past Monday, we are officially a clinical stay company. Congratulations. Yeah. So um, this is a, it's been a whirlwind because I feel like uh, I, I feel very lucky because I, I knew I want to work in the car, in the car T space. And then this job just transitioned so smoothly with what I've been working on and trying to push in the T2I, which is bringing a gene edited car T cell into the into the clinical trial. And um, I, I want, so I wanna say like my current experience right now is not really a transition, but rather like an extension of my T2I program, I feel like, um, because previously I keep thinking of what kind of study do I need to do to show efficacy, how much better it is and all of that. But the past six months, what it's really taught me doing the IND is that how safe the product is, what are the toxicity and all type of different hurdle, or even as trying to think in the business size of how much lentivirus do we need and all of that in um, relation to like the capital of the company. So, yeah, I, I thought it's been a real eye-opening experience so far. Great. Well, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, I'd like to take a small step back. Um, since we're a career-focused podcast, I'm always interested in learning how people first became interested in, in science. Uh, Trang, why don't we start with you? I know you've talked about your engineering background, but even before that, what made you think engineering was something you wanted to do? 
Uh, if you ask me, maybe 12, 13 years ago, I would never think I'll become a scientist, live alone be a cancer scientist. Because um, I, uh, I immigrated here when I was 18 with my dad and no one in my family was in college before. So I was the first one to go to college. And I remember that um, when before I leave, I had a conversation with my grandfather who was actually in the hospital for a couple of weeks at that point. And he told me that when you go to the US, do not give up on your education, like go to college. If you cannot get into college, try to go to a community and work your way up. Just don't give up. So that become like a real big motivations for me. And when I come to the U.S., everything is very different, and I don't really know which career to pick, really. Uh, I just know math, and chemistry was my, my strength, so I chose chemical engineer. But the more I go deep into my study, I realize that I really want to help people and have a stronger impact on the healthcare. So, yeah, so that made me do a research in biomedical engineer, and then I got a fellowship, worked in a cancer center in Amsterdam for a couple months, and I saw, like, all the patients and get all the, those work there. So that made me apply into the NIH, which, which, I, think, which I think was an unmatched opportunity, and that in a short slide, like changed my life because I just feel so lucky to get all the opportunity at NIH and I feel like everyone is just very open about collaborating and helping each other. And my two fellowship that I have at NIH, the IQ program and T2I, have gave me a tremendous just mentorship and support. So yeah, I feel like it's not a straightforward path, but um, I'm really happy with my career right now. Yeah, it sounds like you have, um, you know, you found your way to a great project and a great pathway. So that's that's fantastic. Sabina, what about you? Uh, how did you first get interested in science? Yes, yeah, so um, I think my interest stemmed from from nature. I mean, growing up with my family, we went camping a lot. We went hiking. We traveled over the country to the national parks. Um, and my parents were very knowledgeable about just the natural world. They would know what kind of tree something was and we'd learn about the animals. And I was just really into biology uh, from that sense. And then going through school, in high school, I took every biology class I could. Um, <laughs> and originally I wanted to be a marine biologist or mm. for whales were my favorite animal. Um, but kind of the the day-to-day -day lifestyle of that i don't think i would have enjoyed very much um, so i um i kind of tuned my passion for biology and i really wanted to do something that was impactful uh to to the world and, and to healthcare. so i think that really drove me towards biomedical research um, and i knew just personality wise like i really didn't want to be a doctor um in the from the physician um, aspect of things. So that really drew, drew me towards research. And I, um, I went to University of Maryland, College Park for my undergraduate work, I did a double degree in biology and economics. Um, and then I went to graduate school uh, up in Baltimore, uh, with the University of Maryland Medical School. And um, that was my first really translational lab experience um, in, a, in a cancer immunotherapy lab. And I I loved it. I thought it was very exciting and interesting and relevant. And it was right, not quite at the beginning, but it was still pretty early kind of in the immunotherapy field. And it's really um, exploded so much over the last decade um, with the different types of approaches and technologies that are um, being applied to cancer immunotherapy. So I, I was just really excited about about the science and about the the outcomes. I mean, you look at some of the responses that you get from immunotherapy and it's really just mind blowing what kind of differences can make for patients. So, um, and that, that's kind of my, my career trajectory is pretty, pretty straightforward, but, um, still excited about it nonetheless. 
No, for sure. I mean, um, I, when I was 12, I knew I wanted to do biology. So I get that totally. <laughs> Um, in closing, then, I wonder um, if you have any advice. Uh, let's start with you, Sabina, for l our listeners who are perhaps themselves uh, not yet familiar with the world of tech transfer, but interested in it. W what would you suggest to them? I would suggest to look into it and learn as much as you can and um, take advantage of these opportunities um, at the NCI or outside the NCI. Um, every major university has a technology transfer office. Um, when I was in grad school, I didn't know that existed, but but they do. So if you're interested in anything, um, just go out and talk to people. And I think, as, as Trang mentioned, that was a big kind of skill that I think a lot of people learned through the AIM program is just not being afraid to contact people and talk about, um, to ask them questions and learn from their experiences. And that can apply to advancing your science, but I think that can also apply to advancing your career. So just get out there, talk to people, apply to programs, and learn as much as you can to find out what you like and what you don't like. Trang, any advice for our listeners? Yeah, um, I would say my advice is quite similar to Sabina. Um, I think nobody knows exactly what they want to do when they grow up or 10 years from now. And the only way you learn from it is expose yourself as much as you can and gain on the experience and talk to people and maybe something that is such a dream to you well after you expose it you you don't like it anymore and vice versa um so just put yourself out there and all the experience are valuable experience in my mind so laura we've heard about this great program at uh, nci inside the center for cancer research um, are there programs like this elsewhere at other universities? Sabina mentioned that all universities have tech transfer offices, but do they all have T2Is? That's a great question. I know for the NIH, we are one of the first, maybe only programs. I know the National Institute on Aging saw our program and started to try to create something similar over there. Um, I, I'm not sure that I haven't kept up with it to see where, where they're at. So I don't know if um, maybe we're the trailblazers here, but um, we, we usually only have funding for two fellows each year. And um, so it's still quite small. We do put a lot of training into those fellows. So there's a, a lot of um, preparation that goes on and coordinating amongst the different offices, SBIR and, and TTC. But yeah, I think that, you know, I hope that maybe others out there will hear this podcast and learn more about the program and the success of it, not only for the career development of the fellows, but of the translation of the discoveries and new inventions coming out of their labs and maybe incorporate some similar trainings at, at their organizations or universities. And if uh, they are listening and are interested, I'm, I guess it'd be okay if they reached out to you, Laura, to, to learn about how you built this program and maybe how they could um, build one of their own. Of course. Yeah, it was definitely a collaboration across like multiple people and offices, and I'm happy to share how we made it happen. Great. Well, thank you, um, all, all three of you, for sharing about the T2I. I really appreciate it. Thanks for thank having you, us. Oliver. Yeah, thanks for having us. Now it's time for a segment we call Your Turn, because it's a chance for our listeners to send in a recommendation that they would like to share. If you're listening, then you're invited to take your turn. Send us a tip for a book, a video, a podcast, or a talk that you found inspirational or amusing or interesting. You can send those to us at nciicc at nih.gov. If you record a voice memo and send it along, we may just play it in an upcoming episode. Now I'd like to invite our guests to take their turn. Laura? So I love coffee. And in particular, there is this little coffee shop in my hometown of Utica, New York, okay. that has the most delicious coffee. It's called Utica Coffee Roasting Company. And you can order it online. I'm not paid by them for 
<laughs> anything. I just love their coffee. And if I could recommend a flavor, the cannoli is really good. Mm, okay. Amazing. So if you're in Utica, that's where you need to get your coffee. Yep. You. Or find them online, which we still, we order, my husband and I order from Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Laurie. Well, so Laura and I were joking about this a little bit before we got here about um, you know, what do we love and what might we recommend? And so we're really solid upstate New York girls. We're, we're really rah-rah upstate New York girls. And so I, I think I would, I would go to Wegmans because I grew up with Wegmans and, you know, they're good upstate New York group. Um, so, and unlike others in my office, I don't love to cook. And so I love to go there because I love all of their food and all their prepped food. And I love their pesto sauces so there it is a weird fact so good mm-hmm. <laughs> and is that that's a grocery store i imagine yeah swagman's a gro- you should know that everybody should know that everybody yeah. should know that you should even just if, know that yeah okay. even if they've never been to upstate new york yeah yeah <laughs> even though i'm from corning i'm still gonna plug a rochester group so okay. i guess that's yeah. okay so yeah well thank you for bringing that regional flavor to our yeah. to our show thanks very much <laughs> thank you so go ahead trang what uh, what book are you recommending and and what's it about uh, well, I'm recommending uh, the book called A Lesson in Chemistry, and I believe it just has become a show on Apple TV, I think. And uh, it's just talking about um, being a woman in science, and it was back on um, Sabina. When was that? Was that in the, the 50s, I think? I'm not sure um, about the time frame, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I thought it was quite um, a fun read, and also it's um, it's just very relatable. Interesting. Yeah, that, thank you very much. I appreciate that recommendation. Um, I'm going to make a recommendation of my own as well, just to close out. Um, I'm going to be recommending the All About Grants podcast from the NIH. It's from NIH's Office of Extramural Research and has a ton of information about how to apply for grants and put your best application forward. If you check out their website, you can see the episodes arranged beautifully by area and stage of grant applications. So you can listen to all the episodes on your, uh, but you can also zero in on the content that's most relevant to what you're working on right now. Uh, Shout out to the host, Dr. David Kossub, and his producer, Omar McCrimmon, uh, for leading the way here at NIH in All Things Podcast. A link will be in the notes. That's all we have time for on today's episode of Inside Cancer Careers. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to our guests. We want to hear from you. Your stories, your ideas, and your feedback are always welcome. And you're invited to take your turn to make a recommendation we can share with our listeners. You can reach us at nciicc at nih.gov. Inside Cancer Careers is a collaboration between NCI's Office of Communications and Public Liaison and the Center for Cancer Training. It is produced by Angela Jones and Astrid Masvar. Join us every first and third Thursday of the month when new episodes can be found wherever you listen. Subscribe so you won't miss an episode. I'm your host, Oliver Bogler, from the National Cancer Institute, and I look forward to sharing your stories here on Inside Cancer Careers. If you have questions about cancer or comments about this podcast, email us at nciinfo at nih.gov or call us at 800 800- 422-6237. And please be sure to mention Inside Cancer Careers in your query. We're a production of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute. Thanks for listening. <laughs>